Hello and welcome to the Unbiased Science May Petri Dish. Sort of May. So, well, sort of May, right. <laughs> uh, we're your hosts, Dr. Jessica Steyer. And Dr. Andrea Love. <laughs> and as you may or may not know, our Petri Dish is basically where we hop on once a month and we answer questions that have been submitted by our paid Substack subscribers who are wonderful and support us on a monthly basis. Um, so this is this is fun. Uh, we get lots of questions submitted. Uh, we do our best to keep this pretty brief though. And so if we don't get through all the questions, we'll save them for next month. Um, so without further ado, I'm pulling up the list of questions here. I think a good place to start, Andrea, um, is this question that came from Nicole. Um, so Nicole asked, the new WHO, World Health Organization, guidance to avoid artificial sweeteners reads like a list of the myths debunked in your post and on our podcast um, a couple of years ago. Have the available data changed? If not, why the sudden new recommendations? So if, can I, I'll just set the stage if that's okay, yeah, Andrea, please, and then I know no, we'll please. jump in. So <laughs> I pulled up the World Health Organization. I just wanted to read what actually, you know, change in terms of the recommendations. So they released a new guideline on non-sugar sweeteners, NSS, um, which recommends against the use of NSS to control body weight or reduce the risk of non-communicable diseases. Yeah. The recommendation is... Based on the findings of a systematic review of the available evidence, which suggests that the use of NSS does not confer any long-term benefit in reducing body fat in adults or children, and results of the review also suggest that there may be potential undesirable effects from long-term use of NSS, such as increased risk of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, and mortality. So they're basically saying it's not good um, if you're trying to lose weight, um, and also there there's some potential risks. That, that's what the WHO sort of summarized when they released these, these latest recommendations or guidelines. Now, we, we're a little bit confused by this, and we're not going to lie. I mean, it's like, it's a little bit uncomfortable to, to go against, a, you know, a global public health organization. But we took a look at the review that they, that they cited as really the basis for this. And it's based on observational data. And this is confusing because there are so many RCTs, randomized controlled trials on this very topic that actually show the complete opposite. And we've we've talked at length about the benefit of RCTs over observational data. Um, so what we say still stands. I mean, Andrea, would you agree? <laughs> yeah. So I mean, so I think there's a, there's a couple of things here. First, the the WHO guidance is is nothing about the safety of artificial sweeteners whatsoever. So we did a whole podcast episode where we addressed a lot of the myths and misconceptions about. Um, non-nutritive sweeteners, which include synthetic ones such as sucralose and aspartame and saccharin, as well as natural ones such as stevia, and why they are low or no calorie when we consume them because they are not metabolized in the same ways as nutritive carbohydrates are, like glucose, sucrose, fructose, and so on. The A lot of the myths associated or a lot of the... Um, Demonization of artificial sweeteners um, are things that, um, you know, they claim they harm your microbiome. We, have, we of course, have addressed that um, even more extensively in our last podcast, podcast episode about microbiome. They, um, they claim that, it, you know, they cause all sorts of metabolic disorders, that they cause infertility, that they cause cancer. Um, and of course, we we addressed all those at length, that a lot of those claims are based on um, in vitro or animal studies where you're giving either cells in a Petri dish or animals huge dosages of these sweeteners that a, a human would never encounter to begin with. Um, you know, so again, artificial sweeteners are perfectly safe. WHO makes this statement about replacing nutritive sweeteners with artificial sweeteners as a way to help control weight, um, particularly help to facilitate weight loss, because many people do switch from, say, a regular soda, which is 
sweetened with a nutritive sweetener and they switched to a diet soda, which has zero calories. And again, observational studies aren't as strong as randomized controlled trials. Um, Mm -hmm. There are a lot of confounding variables there. Often these are relying on self-reporting things. So people may not be super forthright or even accurate about what they're consuming. Um, There are probably other things that they're consuming in their diet to replace the, the, the calories that they're not consuming with the, the sweetened beverage. And now, you know, so they're drinking a diet Coke, but now they're eating a large French fries, you know? So it's, again, you you can't, you can't parse that out and say that's, that's due to the consumption of artificial sweeteners. And, And that's why those data are not strong. And it's very bizarre that WHO would make that sort of recommendation when there are randomized controlled trial data that demonstrate that replacing nutritive sweeteners with a low or no calorie sweetener option um, actually does improve, you know, health outcomes. It can lead to weight loss or or maintenance of, of a healthy weight and so on. Well, I was just going to say, just taking a step back, like let, let's ignore the, the ample research that, you know, goes against what the WHO is, is saying here. Um, as you know, as we're saying, these artificial sweeteners, they have fewer calories or no calories, you know, depending, right? Yep. I don't know. Yep. Than, than sh- sugar sweetened beverages, right? And right. so it's sort of like, th- by definition, lower, you know, fewer calories in, that's going to lead to weight loss and fat loss. Like it just, I, there's like a, an implausibility that they're saying that it's, that that's not the case. Like it's by definition, they, right. you know? Right. Um, and so, and so when yeah. you're, when you're looking at those data, then it's okay. Well, well, is your, to- you know, what else are you consuming that right. is making up that difference of calories? If you're not losing weight, then are you not, consuming fewer calories or what else is happening, you know, within that individual. And that's, again, observational studies, you can't control for these, these things. Exactly. So that's what I was going to say. So if we're trying to really just isolate these, you know, artificial sweeteners, that's, we can only do that in an RCT, right? Randomized controlled trial to really isolate, like if, because as Andrea, as you're saying, there are these other things, maybe people are compensating. Those are not, you know, those are going to confound study data in an observational study, but they're controlled for in an RCT. So that's our frustration. And the other thing that really bothered me about this was that they're then going on, you know, beyond the the, the weight control stuff, they went on to say, oh, and by the way, it might cause metabolic disease and heart disease and these other things. When in fact, you, I mean, there was a 2022, a massive JAMA review that showed improved cardiometabolic risk of artificial sweet you know, so it's, it just, it, it, it sort of baffles me. It does. Yeah. And if you look at randomized controlled trials, um, you know, throughout, you know, the past decades, um, randomized controlled trials have demonstrated that artificial sweeteners can actually, um, you know, reduce the hunger cues, um, and lessen sugar cravings so that if you're replacing certain foods with something that is, utilizing a non-nutritive sweetener instead of a, a sugar-based sweetener, a caloric sweetener, um, you can have overall reduced sugar intake. We know excess consumption of sugar is, um, you know, a big cause of excess calorie consumption. So non-nutritive sweeteners can reduce that. Um, they also, you know, they make this claim about increased risk of type 2 diabetes. Presumably, they're looking at things like blood glucose levels and glucose tolerance the the their randomized controlled trials looking at at this facet of artificial sweeteners and they also demonstrate that um you know consuming artificial sweeteners or non-nutritive sweeteners um are safe for diabetics to consume first of all they don't affect blood glucose levels or or glucose management or lead to glucose intolerance and so you know it's it's very frustrating from both a scientific perspective but even a public health perspective because now you're saying you know to these individuals who are trying to maybe be more thoughtful about things that they consume, um, that that now there's a risk in in consuming something that has fewer calories, but they have a sweet tooth and they wanna they wanna satiate that. You know, it's right. you know, it's it's like they're they're saying, okay, well, don't drink soda because that has added sugar, but you can't drink diet soda because we're telling you that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't lead to, you know, it doesn't help you control your body weight. So just drink water. But you know what? That's right. not gonna work for everybody because because some people love the taste of soda and, you know, right. diet soda is the next step in that, in that action. 
there's there's nothing unsafe about consuming artificial sweeteners or artificially sweetened uh, products. And I, I want to get ahead of the comments saying, are, you know, are, are, there, are you just telling people that they should switch to these non-nutritive sweeteners, artificial sweeteners, and that's going to help them with weight loss? I mean, no, everything is multifactorial. You know, if this is one piece of a larger you know, a, attempt that you're making to to potentially like, you know, lose weight or what, whatever at the advice of your of your clinician. It's OK to be. That's what we're saying. There really there aren't compelling data that that say it's unsafe or anything like that. Yeah. Um, and yeah. And we're not advocating. It's not like we are. What do people always say? It's like big, you know, big, big stevia or whatever. Yeah. Big stevia. <laughs> big stevia. Stevia, stevia All right. plant, plant that grows outside. We're, we're big stevia proponents. Big stevia, um, exactly. Do you yeah. want to move on to the next one? Yeah, or did I think, you? I think okay. so. No, no, I think so. I mean, I think, I think again, um, a lot of, a lot of issues with the the data they're using to make this con conclusion. Um, and again, um, nothing about the, the, you know, the fact that they're unsafe. They're not unsafe. Um, Correct. Anyway. All right. Uh, All right. Can I, you want to read the question? Sure. Yeah. So Ashley it. wants to know, is it safe to consume garden vegetables if cats have defecated in the soil? Every so often the neighbor's cat uses the garden as a litter box. And this is a great question. I mean, it's a valid question. It's obviously, you know, something that can happen. I think not even, um, not even just cats, but other animals, right? We're, we're growing vegetables outdoors. There are wild animals, domestic animals, and so on and so forth. Um, so, so certainly, you know, it's not ideal. Um, it's not the end of the world. There are ways to kind of account and reduce the potential risk. Um, but there are some things to keep in mind. So cats, um, you know, especially cats that are allowed to go outdoors and pick up parasites, um, including various types of worms, tapeworms, roundworms, hookworms, and so on. They can also pick up a parasite called toxoplasma, um, which can lead to toxoplasmosis. Um, they also can have bacteria in their GI tract. So when they, um, you know, defecate in soil, um, that those things can enter the soil and potentially pose a risk to humans if you encounter those things. Um, if you are what we call immunocompetent, meaning you have a functioning immune system, toxoplasma in particular is not terribly concerning. But if you are immunocompromised or if you're pregnant, um, this is the same parasite that's the reason why pregnant people can't, shouldn't scoop litter boxes um, because, because toxoplasma can be potentially serious if you're immunocompromised. Um, but generally speaking, you know, the relative health risk is, is not super high. Um, they, they certainly can have bacteria that can lead to things like gastroenteritis. If you do eat something that has had cat defecation on it. Um, but, but one of the bigger things is once a cat decides that they like pooping in your garden bed, it's going to have their scent on them and, and scent on it. And they're going to go back for more. So, um, you know, the soil in a garden bed is really soft and they like to dig in it. And so often, um, you know, you want to try to deter them. So first, if this is your neighbor's cat, I don't know how close you are with your neighbor, but maybe suggest to them keep their cats indoor only. That's better for their health and longevity as well. It means that they're less likely to pick up parasites and get sick. They're less likely to get hit by cars. Um, there's their data that demonstrate that it can almost double the lifespan of a cat. Um, so, so indoor only is always best. Um, if you're not close to your neighbor, you don't feel comfortable having that conversation, um, try to deter them. Um, so putting things in the, the garden bed that they won't want to dig around in. So pine cones are a really great deterrent. This is something that you can also do if your cats um, go to the bathroom in your indoor plants in your house. Um, stones, like rock stones, um, like aluminum foil, things that are like crunchy or hard, they don't want to dig around in. Um, if you can fence it in, um, you know, that, that's an option too. Um, and then, you know, aside from that, if none of those things work, the cat is still pooping in the garden bed, um, you know, try to avoid eating produce that has been in direct contact with the feces, um, particularly anything that's growing underground. So radishes or carrots or beets or potatoes, things like that. Um, because if they poop on the soil or poop in the soil and it rains, anything in the feces can get distributed in there. Um, and either way, you know, whatever you pick from your garden, you want to wash anyway, because even if there isn't a cat in there, there could be a woodchuck peeing in your garden or a fox or who knows what else. I mean, you know, there are animals all around, um, you know, so so it's just good practice to wash your veggies. 
So Andrew, we actually get a question a lot about how to properly clean fruits and veggies. And I know the CDC recommends against using soaps or detergents, and they recommend um, running fruits and veggies, you know, just produce under running warm water. You could also scrub them. Mm -hmm. um, is that your recommendation? I mean, I know some people ask about vinegar. Yeah, absolutely. Um, totally, totally agree. Um, running water is great. If you have um, certain produce items that obviously have like um, dimpling in them where things can kind of get trapped like a potato, uh, vegetable brush is great because um, that can help kind of um, loosen anything that's kind of caked on there. Again, it's not, you don't want, you're not going to sterilize your produce, right? Unless you have right. like an irradiation machine at your house, which, which people don't have, um, you know, it's, it's food of the earth and there are inevitably going to be things on them. Remember that 99.9% .9 of microorganisms out there are harmless to humans, um, you know, but, but anything you consume has a potential risk, even if you prepare it as properly as possible. Um, you don't right. need to use vinegar. You don't need to soak it in things. You don't need to disinfect it. Right. Um, yeah. So running warm water, scrubbing if you need. And also just a reminder that you should also be washing things with a peel, especially if you're going to cut, because once you cut the peel, anything that's on the outside of the peel could get into your fruit, your vegetable, whatever it is. Totally agree. Um, I will say that I am guilty of doing none of those things. Um, I am notorious for... <laughs> not washing my vegetables. I will buy blueberries, bring them home and start eating them right out of the box while I'm driving. And it super grosses Josh out. But, um, you know, but I Andrea, the pesticides. Yeah, right. I know. <laughs> um, I haven't, um, you know, haven't, haven't died yet. Um, but yeah, um, if you do want to be cognizant of that, um, washing the produce with, with warm water, um, also washing your hands before prepping and handling the produce. Um, and that you can use soap and water to wash your hands. So if you did have anything on your hands, you don't want to transfer it to the produce. Um, so just good ha hand hygiene whenever you're in the kitchen. Love that. But seriously, though, I'm sorry, because I'm, I'm envisioning the trolls coming or just people, honestly, not even trolls, people who have genuine questions about what about pesticides on fruits and veggies? Yeah. I mean, is that something you're oh, concerned yeah. about? Or might the answer be that it's there in such a low concentration, yeah. such a small amount that it's not going to harm us? That's that's the answer. Um, these <laughs> okay. these pesticide residues that you're hearing all about, whether it's, you know, the conventional pesticides in particular are so heavily monitored. Those levels of residues are minuscule. Their trace. It is not anything that's going to pose a health risk, um, you know, and, and of course, organic um, produce uses pesticides and some in larger quantities. Um, you know, I haven't seen a ton of data that consuming those unwashed is, is necessarily a health risk either. I personally may be a little more wary and might wash those um, if I did opt for organic produce, because I do know that the levels of organic pesticides used are higher. Um, but again, if they're grown in a responsible manner, the levels should not pose a risk to humans. All right, Andrea, this next one is a question we get all the time. And I know that we we do have posts in the works on this topic, yes, but do. we maybe do. we can give a little, little bit of a teaser for folks, uh, or a little something. Um, so. Think? So this question came from Eric, who asked, we hear a lot about processed food with some described as ultra processed, but these ter these terms are too vague to be useful. What is the truth behind the buzzwords? Andrea, I know you have a lot to say. Do you want to kick things off? Yeah, sure. So, so you're right. You know, these are kind of buzzwords um, with, with, amorphous meanings. Um, so, you know, processed foods and ultra processed foods are, are phrases that we hear a lot in the media and social media and even with some health organizations. Um, but there really isn't a standard criteria or definition of what this means. And in reality, pretty much everything we eat is processed. Even fresh produce is processed. It's picked. It's usually power washed to remove slugs and things like that that grow on lettuce leaves. Um, often it's trimmed and, and sometimes it's irradiated to, any, to remove any potential bacteria. Um, so, you know, if you're talking about any sort of, you know, manipulation of food before it gets to your mouth, technically everything is processed. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess colloquially, you know, you might think of processed foods that 
that are foods that have been altered in some degree to maybe improve storage or, or extend shelf, shelf life. So things like um, canned food products like tuna fish or, um, um, you know, legumes, beans, chickpeas, um, you know, canned vegetables. It would also include things like cheeses and yogurts and things like that. It could also include tofu, which is fermented soybean, um, you know, any sort of fruits in, in um, canned or, or jarred in, in juices or in syrups. And and, and really anything that's like baked. So breads, um, bakery items, you know, those are all processed officially. Um, again, no standard definition, but that's maybe how you want to view it. Um, ultra processed foods, again, there's no standard definition. Um, but colloquially, you know, the consensus is it's maybe made with more ingredients um, that are derived or extracted from, you know, whole foods as opposed to whole foods themselves. Um, maybe it has a lot of added sugars or or um, or salts or fats or things like that. Um, they may have um, added sweeteners or colorings or flavorings or or preservatives. Um, although processed foods also do often contain preservatives and salts as well. Um, but I guess loosely you could say like fast foods, um, you know, um, cold cuts, um, sodas, um, sugared, um, you know, fake juice beverages like Gatorades and Powerades, um, you know, any sort of like prepackaged cookies or chips or crackers or things like that. So, you know, your, your hostesses or your tasty cakes or your, you know, your, your cheese doodles or Cheetos, like those would all maybe fall into the umbrella of ultra processed foods. So I really take issue with this because this entire class of food, which, by the way, as Andrea said, has no standard definition, is being just blanketly vilified, um, you know, as a human, as a mom, as a person who's busy. I mean, occasionally I'll grab fast food. I'll, you know, I, I, I enjoy an occasional uh, whatever ding dong or whatever oh, <laughs> where those things oh, are. Yeah arts and stuff. Should we be subsisting solely on these things? No, of course not. But if you occasionally reach for these things out of convenience or because of a craving, this is not the end of the world. Every time I open up my TikTok, they are coming for bread, Andrea. Bread is the latest thing on the chopping block. I love it, bread. You don't need to cut out these things entirely. Yeah, yeah I don't. Well, it, yeah, and, and yeah, and on, and on top of that, you know, it's it's the issue becomes when the majority of your dietary consumption of calories is these things, and the reason for that is that they don't have a lot of other nutrients. They have calories, which yes, you need calories for energy, but they don't have fiber. They don't have vitamins and minerals. They don't have, you know, these sorts of substances that first are gonna maintain fullness, um, improve your digestion, all the other things that we talked about during our fiber episode. And so what's gonna end up happening is that you're gonna be eating a lot of what, you know, people often call empty calories and they're not gonna satiate you. So maybe you're gonna eat more calories than you normally would. Plus, you're not getting the added benefits of things like fiber. And so your dietary, um, you know, profile on the whole is not ideal. It's not the singular food itself. It's the contribution to your whole diet. So, yeah, I mean, I ate a bag of chips yesterday. They were delicious. I wanted them. Whatever. I'm going to now have a salad. You know, I had a salad for lunch with some hard boiled eggs cut up in it. You know, it's all about moderation. You don't want your whole diet to be ultra processed foods. So, again, you have to, there has to be nuance when you have these conversations. Nuance. Yes, exactly. Are we sitting here and telling you that, you know, white bread is healthy and you should have it three times a day every single day? No, of course not. I, I just, it really bothers me whenever, when things are, us, obviously, we talk about this all the time, when things are made so black and white and there's so much guilt and so much shaming. And again, me as, you know, just again, playing the, the mom card, it's especially, it's like double guilt yeah. when yeah. I'm feeding my kids and every now and then, do they want a happy meal? I mean, yeah, yeah, because they're delicious. So Exactly. Yeah. And it's okay. And yeah. no, this is not sponsored by McDonald's. My children, I'm trying so hard, Andrew. I'm sure I'm like blocking because I don't want them in the screen. All right. Um, yeah. You want to no, move I on mean, to the Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say, you know, again, it's 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 all about moderation and and of course, you know, that's not that's not a flashy thing to say, right? You know, right. um, but but that's the reality here. And and anyone that's that's making these all or none statements, like you just be wary. 
Exactly. That is a good rule of thumb for everything in life. Um, okay, let's move on to the next question. This one came from um, Eileen. Regarding COVID boosters, why can't I get a second booster? In a recent interview with Dr. Peter Hotez, <clears throat> it was stated that 90% of current COVID deaths were of people 50 and over. I repeatedly read that the FDA doesn't think that people will take the booster since only a low number of the population is fully vaccinated and boosted as a reason not to approve a spring booster. Why is that even a consideration? Shouldn't they only be looking at whether it will reduce risk for those of us older than 50 and not cause harm and let the individual decide? All right. This is something we get asked about a lot. I don't know. I think this was submitted during our April um, round of questions, and I can't remember the timing, but the FDA has authorized a second booster for individuals who are 65 and older or immunocompromised. And Andrea, as an immunologist, can speak to this, but, you know, as, as I'll probably say this and butcher it and you'll cringe, but as we age, our immune systems age and become less robust and able to, you know, to, to come to, to fight illness, or I'm sorry if I'm saying that, yeah, probably yeah. saying so, that terribly. So, yeah, no, no, I mean, in both ways, right? Like as you get older, you, um, you mount a less robust response to vaccination as well as, um, you know, you might not yes. be able to fend off illness as, as potently. Um, so, so that's why it's been authorized for that group. And, and to your point, you know, yes, we, we see that the uh, mortality rate is higher as we age, right? At 50 and older. Um, but it's, largely a result of the fact that people are not fully vaccinated, people are not fully boosted. So if you are an individual, let's say between 50 and 65, I'm assuming based on your question, you fall in that range, but you did get that, you know, your primary vaccine series, you did get that booster. The data show that you are still very well protected from the more severe outcomes, hospitalization and death. And honestly, I mean, we say, we, the FDA has said they're trying to move toward um, a, you know, a more a vaccine. standardized approach. It, exactly. A more standardized approach. So they probably don't, my, my guess is they don't want to throw out another booster and then they're going to come up with an annual, you know, vaccine for us to use, especially if the data show that you're pretty well supported right now. If you're right. And, and, and also, you know, there's enough confusion, there's enough misinformation circulating, you know, while it's unlikely to be harmful to, you know, secretly go get a booster that you're not technically authorized to get. Um, you know, it's just we don't want to add to the confusion. That's why there are schedules for recommended vaccinations, whether it's COVID, whether it's Tdap, whether it's pneumococcus, pneumonia, wh whether it's, you know, chicken pox or shingles or so on. Mm -hmm. um, and as for the 65 and older and immunocompromised, my mom is, I think, believe 67. She just went and got her second booster. I mean, if you're in that age range, definitely make sure that you, you're you getting the, you know, the recommended second booster. So again, if you're over 65 or older or immunocompromised, you can get a second booster. All right, Andrew, do you want to answer just one more question? Yeah, I think or did one you have... more. Yeah, okay. no, I think, I think one more. Um, so Nicole, this is an interesting question. So Nicole wants to know, is remineralizing teeth a real thing? And is it actually helpful? So the answer is yes, right? So once enamel wears away, uh, it can't repair itself, but it's possible to repair and strengthen weakened enamel. Now, there are lots of products out there that they make very you know, wild claims about remineralization that we cannot attest to, but there are some basic things that do improve um, or, you know, promote the remineralization of your teeth. Um, so we know that increased saliva production, and Andrea, I know you wanted to talk about that, but that's a great way to repair tooth enamel. Mm -hmm. um, it's because essential components in your saliva, such as calcium and phosphate, they can help to neutralize acids that we're consuming, that we get from our diet, food, and drink, and help to remineralize the teeth. And so saliva is basically our body's natural defense against cavities. Did you want to talk about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, sure. So, you know, when we talk about like the remineral the the remineralization or even demineralization, we're talking about erosion uh and destruction of the hard components of your tooth. So that's the enamel which is kind of the outermost layer, the the white part that you see on your tooth. Underneath that you have the dentin and the cementum and then within those you have your pulp um, where the nerves are and the blood vessels that are supplied. 
Um, and so obviously you don't want the hard tissues to get destroyed, um, but there are things that can impact that. And so certain things that can impact that um, would be genetics. Some people are just more predisposed to having weaker enamel production. And so it can become demineralized more quickly. Um, there are certain bacteria that live in the mouth. And if they, if the conditions are more hospitable to them growing um, in higher quantities, that can lead to, um, you know, the development of things like dental caries, which is, is often sometimes called a cavity or tooth decay, um, which, which starts as a bacterial infection that essentially erodes the enamel um, and causes demineralization. So addressing those infections, um, you can obviously address those with things like fl fluoridated toothpaste. Fluoridated toothpaste or fluoridated water can really substantially help. Um, and these bacteria are often um, the most common species is a species called strep mutans, um, streptococcus mutans. Um, and, and of course, if you let that go unchecked, that can progress further. Um, but, but increased saliva production can also inhibit um, the adhesion of those bacteria within the mouth cavity. Now, I just, I made a face while you were saying that because fluoride is, it's honestly, it's a public health miracle is what it is. And if you look at the data before and after water became fluoridated, I mean, it's astounding to see the number of yeah, cavities. Absolutely. Um, but anyway, so, uh, and if you have any questions about fluoride, we have tons of content. Check our searchable database at, um, what is it? Uh, uspodsources.com. I always get yep. our site wrong. Okay. So other ways to increase saliva production. Um, I've heard dentists recommend sugar-free gum that gets saliva going. Certainly drinking, making sure that you're staying hydrated is important and obviously fluoridated tap water is, is a great option. Um, if you are eating or you know consuming something that's very acidic, it's a good idea to rinse your mouth afterwards. Um, and again, that's going to be more of an issue for some people than others. And some of that yes. is genetics. And some people have absolutely no control over that. You know, for yes. example, you know, I have, you know, some friends and they've had, uh, you know, a dozen cavities because they just have genetics where they don't produce a lot of really sturdy enamel. Um, you know, whereas I have never had a cavity in my life. Um, you know, and so, you know, if what? you are, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> okay. If you, if you are prone to cavities to begin with, you know, just improving your dental hygiene, flossing is super important on top of, you know, all of these things to stay hydrated and improving your saliva levels and, and all of that as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just make sure you're getting foods rich in calcium, um, fiber rich foods actually help us produce um, saliva, which I didn't realize, but I was just reading about that. Um, and I was going to say that, yes, you know, there are remineralizing toothpastes. I have used Pronamel for many years. This is not endorsed or, you know, sponsored by Pronamel. I'm sure there are others. Um, and then and the, really yeah. any, any toothpaste that contains fluoride is going yes. to help with that. Absolutely. And, and we often, I mean, there are people who want to avoid fluoride for reasons that we don't understand, but if that's the case for you, there is, you know, there are some good data to support hydroxy appetite, appetite. Yeah, appetite, I appetite. And yeah. we've done posts on that. Um, but the reason that that's not more mainstream is because it's a lot more expensive than yeah. fluoride. So if yeah. you want to use that, go for it. Um, but it's going to cost you more. All right, Andrea, I feel like we got through a lot of content. We're just at around 30 minutes. I'm very proud of us. Um, <laughs> and we want to say a sincere thank you. Thank you to those um, who continue to support us by subscribing to our Substack. I think this is honestly probably the one of the biggest benefits of subscribing is that you get to submit questions every month that we answer, obviously in this format, you get access to our private Facebook group where, you know, Andrea and I are, we're, we're active in there. You have a direct line to us. Um, and also we lean on our Substack subscribers to sometimes help us pick podcast topics, post topics. So, oh, and I think there are some like merch discounts. There's, there's all kinds of benefits. So definitely yeah. check that out. Um, where can they, so what's the oh, website? It's, um, the unbiasedpod.substack.com and it's five bucks a month. <laughs> I was like, catch you next time. I was waiting for you to say the, the catch you next time. Can you say it? <laughs> catch you next time on the pod, your trusted source for no nonsense, just science. <laughs> dance, just monkey dance. <laughs> 
I just love it. I'm sorry. All right. Thank you so much. See you next month. Bye, everyone. <laughs>